Hello everybody, hope you're all doing well. My name is Steven and this is the Storytime channel. Today we have some malicious compliance stories and our first story of the day is by the articulate grunt. What was that room number again, sir? I was a captain at the time and had been assigned as chief of security for an army hospital. So as the lingo goes when the calls came down, I was Dr. Strong. I was in my office though when a lieutenant colonel came in. Hey there captain, need you to take care of an issue for me. Of course sir, if it is within my area and power I'll see what I can do. Well the general driver's wife is in the maternity ward having just had her baby and she has a problematic roommate, always closing the curtain and blocking her line of sight to the window, also messing with the TV. I need this woman moved to another room. Um, that's definitely outside my area of control, sir. I don't oversee or control anything with patients unless it's an issue of security, safety, or... Yes, yes, I know, but you know everyone, and the doctors and nurses will listen to you more than me. You are one of them now, and they rely on you. Sir, really? I know, I know, no promises. This would really make the general happy, though. His driver is like a second son to him, so I would really owe you. It's room number XYA. Just give it your best for a fellow infantryman, okay? Breathe deep. Wait a minute. What room number again, sir? He smiled. XYA. Roger, sir. I'll look into it and do my best. I've got a couple favors I might be able to use. Outstanding, thanks. And he left. So on up I went to maternity to find the head nurse. She was not pleased as apparently the lieutenant colonel had been up there earlier trying to sling his weight around and came to find me when it had no effect. I pointed out the room though and she smiled. We both chuckled a little bit and I asked, so can you help me out with making this all be good, please? Giving me a big friendly smile, well the corner room is open, we could move the bothersome lady in there though she will likely have a new roommate later today. Then again, once the bed is clean and reset, we will likely be putting another lady in with the driver's wife too. Matter of fact, she paused looking over the files. It will probably be Mrs. Hispanic Lady having her fourth kid. She was likely to be going in the corner room, but with the move, she would have to go in with the driver's wife. I say, well, if that's how it has to be, as long as we can accommodate the lieutenant colonel's request. The head nurse says, okay, but you were helping move the lady out of the room. I say yes ma'am, of course. The lady who had been causing such disturbances for the driver's wife was quite calm and gave no issues with the move nor even asked any questions. I called the lieutenant colonel once it was done and made sure to tell him I had no concrete knowledge if or when a new roommate would be moved into the room but that the staff was really not happy with the move and extra work. He thanked me and I never heard anything of it again. The entertaining part of the whole thing? The bothersome lady who got the room with the better view, the woman who had kept closing the curtain for some privacy and turning down the loud crap the driver's wife kept putting on the TV, was my wife who just had our first kid. So who do you think really was the entitled one here? Was the driver's wife the entitled one? Or was the bothersome lady who kept closing the curtains and adjusting the TV the bothersome one? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Kelmanvor Sparky Fox. Dig there? Really? Okay. Way back when, I was working for a small company that was a mixture of contract and retail floristry and landscaping. One of our clients was a large local conferencing hotel. We started off supplying them with flowers for their corporate clients and then their main points of customer contact. And finally, the boss talked them into letting us work on the grounds as well. After a few years of this very profitable arrangement, they asked us to help with the installation of a new CCTV system. Specifically, they wanted the other boss, it was a partnership, to use his mini digger to create the trenches for the cables. We were fine with this, boss 2 loved using his little digger, and boss 1 would accrue more prestige within the hotel. However, because they weren't stupid, both bosses wanted the okay of the hotel's telco that the planned route was safe and definitely would not involve putting the digger bucket through the hotel's main trunk. This was agreed. Then we came to try to get the okay. Ah, said telco, known affectionately as brainless tosspots by those who've had to deal with them, did in fact have a service for just this eventuality. What they didn't do was provide staff to answer the phone. After a week or so of trying, we still only had a vague idea of where the trunk was. 
and so Boss 2 was reluctant to put Digger to turf. Boss 1 was fielding calls from the purchasing manager, the front of house manager, the deputy manager, and finally the general manager, all of whom had been getting crap from the hotel's owners. Boss 1 was polite but firm with them all, pointing out that delaying the installation of the CCTV was surely less disruptive than cutting off all communications into and out of a conferencing hotel. Four managers agreed with him. The owners didn't. Finally, Boss 1 said that he would tell Boss 2 to start digging only on receipt of a written order to do so that also absolved the company of any and all resulting damages. The fax machine whirred into life. I said that this was way back when. Boss 1 called Boss 2. Boss 2 started work. Within five minutes, the hotel had lost all communications. On a Friday afternoon, their peak time for getting last-minute booking requests from people with a money-to-sense ratio I can only dream of. Oh, the hotel also worked with insurance companies. They had a number of apartments that were hideously expensive, but were also popular when it came to housing people who'd had house fires and the like. Of course, they tried to deflect this. We showed the owners their written instruction, which was nice. When the telco got involved, they also tried to blame us. We pointed out that if they'd provide their service as advertised, we'd have known where not to dig. We did not end up on the hook for the damaged telephone trunk or the hotel's lost sales. Sadly, I was not privy to the arrangement reached between the hotel and the telco, but I did notice a reduction in quotes for any hard landscaping work at the hotel. Really people, if someone is looking out for your best interests and they ask for your repeated instructions in writing, have a think about what you're demanding. It's not even when they're asking for your repeated instructions in writing, it's that when they're literally telling you the issues with what you're trying to demand over and over and you just keep deflecting it. Of course you want something done, but you gotta do it smartly. I have a feeling that the owners of these hotels probably aren't too accustomed to people telling them no. This next story is by 1-8v6, clean the whole engine? I'll clean out your wallet. This happened in my grade 12 mechanics class. The entire course revolved around removing, disassembling, fixing, and then reassembling a car's engine. I was very mechanically inclined for my age, owned like 6 cars by the time I was 17. I also had experience rebuilding the same motor I was assigned to work on, Honda D-Series. We had a group of four and along with myself, my group had one other super talented guy and two other dudes who had done their fair share of wrenching on their own time. Needless to say, we were way ahead of schedule and my shop teacher was not happy about it. We had our engine out before some groups even had the exhaust disconnected. As soon as we hauled the engine out and set it down, our shop teacher told us to clean the entire engine. His reasoning was the grease and oil on the engine was unsafe and our hands could slip on it. If you've ever dealt with grease before, you know brake cleaner gets that stuff right off. So that's what we did. Six cans of brake clean, five cans of sea foam, and two cans of WD-40 later, that engine looked the same it did when it rolled off the assembly line. We even sprayed some silicone lubricant on the gaskets and penetrating oil into all the bolt holes we could to make disassembling the engine even easier. After class that day, I found myself at the auto parts store to pick up some parts for the ungodly amount of project cars I had. In the store, I see my mechanics teacher handing over two $100 bills to the person on the till with a bunch of cans of brake clean, WD-40, sea foam, silicone lube, and penetrating oil in his basket. He left us alone after that, and we had the engine back in the car and running like a clock with two months left in the semester. Ended up having a beer with him and the other savvy guy in my group after we graduated. Lots of laughs about clearing his wallet out. We both bought him a six pack to make up for it. Haven't had that much fun turning a wrench since. Good times. 
Although maybe they seemed like a jerk at the time, one thing I actually kind of like about this shop teacher is that although you were advanced and doing stuff way ahead of the expected schedule, they kept challenging you to keep doing more work and try to accomplish new and more challenging things. Yeah, it really was unfair because you fulfilled exactly what they were wanting you to do, but they kept you on your toes and, in some form, contributed potentially to you learning a little bit more about handling engines and taking care of engines. This next story is by The Real Borkus. School Wants Quiet Students Setting the scene, I went to a very small new charter high school. I was a member of the second class that ever graduated with my 25 classmates. There were around 150 people in the entire high school, and I was known for being the rowdiest of all. I spent more time suspended slash detention than in class. The Malicious Compliance One day, I'm chatting in the back class with some friends, and this one teacher just finally snaps. Can you guys just go one mother freaking day without making any noise? Cue Malicious Compliance The entire rest of the day. I spend getting every student in the entire high school, plus a cool teacher and the janitor, to agree to not speak or make a single noise the following day. No loud shoes, no running, walk quietly, all phones on silent, not vibrate, no chewing gum, the whole nine yards. Following day, to my surprise, literally everyone comes through to stage this weird, pointless, silent protest. The first class is super tense. You can literally hear the expo marker writing on the whiteboard. The teacher's questions hang in the air with eerie lack of reply, even from the normal teacher's pets, but it goes on. Immediately after, all the teachers, except one who has noticeably called in today, are asking each other in the hallway what the freak is going on. Second period rolls in and the teachers are starting to ask lots of questions, clearly beginning to freak out, because the silence is so unnatural. By third period, somehow no one has broken yet, and the principal walks into the class where I am, points at me and gestures for me to follow. In her office, she looks at me point blank, asks, What did you do? I know you're behind this. I say nothing but stifle a laugh. She tells me I've earned attention. I don't care. Literally the rest of the day, no one speaks or makes a sound, and teachers and staff come ask me what the freak is going on every 15 minutes. Once school ends and we're outside the building, the cacophony of student laughter erupts. We explain the next day, and nothing comes of it, but the teachers ask specifically that we never do that again. When I saw the janitor the next day, he said it was hilarious, and none of the staff even attempted to speak to him, so he just got to watch everyone panic because of quiet, well-behaved teenagers. They got exactly what they asked for. You're gonna snap and yell at the students to be absolutely quiet, why can't you go one day without making any noise? Well, poof got exactly what you wanted. Was it worth it? Apparently not. Our next story is by Breakaway Salmon, Karen's Bad Day at the Fair. I ran a lemonade stand at the time and I was pretty young, maybe 19 to 20. I had been working this job for quite some time now and while there was no official manager position for the stand, that's the role I played. It was a pretty slow day, so I was the only one in the stand, my coworker being on an extended break. We often take two to three hour breaks alternating through the day. You know that meme, the original Karen meme? Yeah, that woman, or at least very well could have been her, walks up to my stand to order a lemonade, followed by who I assume is her son, close in age to myself. I have made literally thousands of lemonades at this point working fairs. There's one simple recipe, and unless I'm asked prior to adjust it, which I'm happy to do, I make it per hour recipe. Well, I make the lemonade and hand it to her. After one sip, Karen becomes furious. Did you put sugar in this lemonade? Uh, yeah, why? You don't put sugar in lemonade. Yes, ma'am, that's part of our recipe. Well, you don't put sugar in my lemonade. Well, if you'd like one without sugar, I'm happy to make you one, but I didn't know... I shouldn't have to ask, you don't put sugar in lemonade. Karen's son is in the background mouthing apologies profusely. This is not their first rodeo. Okay, apologies ma'am, let me make you another one. 
I go to my cooler where I had stored away a one gallon jug of pure lemon juice I had squeezed the day before from lemons that would not hold up much longer in the heat. Take a cup with some ice and fill it to the brim. No water to dilute it. Straight lemon juice. I hand her the cup and watch her take a sip, even more angry. What the heck is this? Give me my money back. I'm sorry ma'am, but I don't do refunds for custom orders. Karen almost yelling, I need to speak to your manager right now. I am the manager. Please leave my stand. A good 5 to 10 seconds go by while she stands there, incredulous and absolutely fuming before her son, trying to hold back a smile, convinces her to leave so they can go try a different stand. I still feel bad for the son to this day, as he was incredibly embarrassed over the situation and seemed like a pretty polite guy. Beyond me how a woman with that sort of entitlement could possibly raise a son like that, but who knows what was going on in her life that day. Either way, it makes no difference to me. I got my sweet revenge. I think it's maybe because the mom doesn't have common sense and the son does. Growing up experiencing their parent being a Karen, maybe they were one of the few that actually feel embarrassed about that kind of activity. The kind of person that just innately knows that's not right. And our final story of the day is by Jade Crow. Need me to clean your oven? No problem. This happened to me when I was a field tech for a commercial restaurant repair company. The company charged me $110 an hour port to port, meaning from the time I left the shop till I returned. Being from the southwest, I resemble much of the back of house staff and working on ovens, I was usually dirty as well. On this particular day, the chef had called in a service call for a convection oven that wasn't working and I had just finished ordering the parts when some top brass from the front office came in the kitchen to harass the back of house staff I suppose. One dude in a pair of khakis and a button up asked me why the ovens were as dirty as they were and I said, got no idea. Well, you need to get them cleaned up. Now, usually I would have told him to kiss my butt and walk out, but this particular day, I decided to help him out. So I stayed a couple of hours and cleaned up his oven at $110 an hour. Of course, he disputed the invoice and threatened not to pay, but I had parts on order for another piece of equipment. And if you don't pay, I don't come back and put your crap back together. So yeah, he paid. Well, I don't normally do cleaning as part of my service, but hey, at that price, I'll be glad to get in there and clean up for you at $110 an hour. It's a little bit of a gamble doing that expecting them to pay it, but if you can walk the walk and you feel confident that you can stand your ground on the invoice, more power to you. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So which of these stories was your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. But besides that, if you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing and turn notifications on if you haven't so you'll never miss an upcoming video. Any little thing that you do helps the channel grow so much more. Whether it's commenting, subscribing, or just watching the video, thank you all so very much for supporting me right here on the Storytime channel. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll see you all next time right here on the Storytime channel.